Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Collaborative Theatre for this session of Linux ConfAU. Um, our next speaker is Kirk Jackson, coming to us from all the way from Wellington, and he will be teaching us how to secure that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. This is my first time coming to LCA, and I've been blown away at the, the talks that I've been to. Uh, I've been to a great talk about the, the history of security in Linux, um, the first one second of boot and how that actually works, um, paper circuits. Um, that's just some amazing stuff here, and I'm really proud to be able to stand here and talk to you. Uh, so my name's Kirk Jackson. Um, this talk is going to talk about how to secure websites uh, when you don't actually write the website. So this kind of comes from my experience working in security teams for a few companies. Um, Zero, I started the security team there, and um, a public transport ticketing provider as well. Um, and sometimes you just want to do things faster than the dev process can do. So this talk's not about where I work, although the place that I work does really similar things to this talk, but doesn't use any of the stack. Um, so this is not an advertisement talk. Cool. So you've got a great idea and you want to build an application. How do you do it securely? Well, the idea normally starts with a person and you're like, uh, I understand this user's needs and they really need to capture their to-do lists or uh, they, they want to track um, location of their friends or whatever. And you're like, I'm going to build an app for them. So you spin up a software development lifecycle um, and you toil away building your MVP or your first product. And the time comes when you need to publish it on a web server. Uh, so you want to stick that app on a server, deploy it probably <coughs> manually to start with, um, and put that web server on the internet so you can try it with the user and see, um, see how they like your to-do list app. You know, maybe they like to capture to-dos differently than you. Um, but but you're a good, conscientious person, and you're like, well, I know I can't just put the web server on the internet. I have to put a firewall in front of it, and I have to treat the server special, like it's my production server, um, and I don't want you know, nasty developers touching it. Uh, and so now it's secure, right? Um, but then you collect credit card payments, and this thing called PCI comes in, and it says you have to put AV on your web server, which I don't even understand why. Um, you have to filter outgoing traffic with a proxy. You have to have a WAF for incoming traffic to go through. Um, and now you're secure for PCI, right? Um, and then you're like, well, you know, configuration's hard to manage, so we need a config agent. Um, we need to be able to detect data leaving our environment that's sensitive, so we need data loss prevention. Um, we need to detect intrusions. Um, we need to manage users and identity and make sure they've got the right permissions. Um, and then, oh yeah, I guess we need to capture the logs for that somewhere, so we need a seam. Um, and now you're secure, because you've got all this stuff. Oh, but the dev team might not even be producing secure code to start with, so you institute some kind of training for the dev team, you do security reviews of the architecture, you do some threat modeling um, to see if there's anything you haven't considered, you might do some static analysis, so uh, code scanning at compile time. You might do some dynamic analysis, you know, uh, automated running through your app, looking for security holes. Or you might do some interactive security analysis, which um, I don't even know what that is. Hey, the bottom of my screen's missing. Um, and you're, you're now secure because you're building secure code. Um, you might even have a fancy RASP, which I don't really know what it is, but you put that in your web server and it makes you secure. Um, but then, oh, the OS is probably not hardened, so you, know, you need some procedures for hardening your OS and you know, removing unneeded services, managing patches to make sure it stays up to date. You, know, you want to uh, monitor the files to make sure that no one's got onto your server and changed the executables. Um, you need some kind of governance process to make sure that someone quits or changes roles. Um, they get their access removed. Um, you need some overarching configuration management to manage all the config agents and all of that. So now you're secure. Oh, 
cloud workflow protection. You've talked to a salesperson and realized that you need this. Um, oh, you need to automate your app releases uh, because you don't want uh, to do things manually anymore. Let me resize. Oh, seriously? Uh, I'm intentionally not going full screen. Um, app release automation. Okay, now you need to monitor the systems and you need to monitor the seam to make sure the seam's monitoring the other stuff and you know, you know who watches the watcher and all of that. And then you need policies to make sure that people actually do this and that you can fire them if they don't and you need standard operating procedures. And now you're secure. And then your management goes, well, who's checking that you've done all this properly? Uh, oh, geez, well, I guess we can do some vulnerability scans. We can have third party come in and do config reviews for $1,000 a day. Uh, we can get some penetration tests. Um, they'll come in at, a, I don't know, a couple of thousand dollars a day. Um, and now we're secure. So now your to-do list app is ready. Oh, but, but there might be attacks coming in. Are they going to bypass all of that stuff? So this is the blueprint for how to build a secure to-do list application. And we've got how to build it securely in our dev process. We're able to host it securely and manage it. And we've got third parties verifying that it's secure. What do you reckon the approximate cost of this would be? Uh, I don't know, I just made that up. 42 is a good number. Um, you know, it's a significant cost to keep your system secure in today, today's environment. And this was just so you could build a secure web application. But what if there's bugs in your application? So lots of issues in applications these days are not about the hosts and the hardening and the configuration reviews. It's actually bugs in the code, you know, SQL injection or cross-site scripting or something like that. And that's how the big companies tend to get breached is through the application logic. And if you do have a breach in your application, uh, if you do have an issue in your application, how are you going to be protected? Well, if it's something simple like cross-site scripting, your web application firewall might detect it because there's sort of common patterns that it can look for. Um, or the RASP might, un might notice unusual behavior in your app. But if it's a business logic bug, then none of that stuff that you've paid $4.2 million for, um, or if it, uh, none of that stuff is going to catch it, right? Because it's actually a logic issue in your app. Like, your app lets someone, I don't know, do things they're not allowed to do. None of those appliances are going to know roles and privileges in your application. Um, and so you've got to rely on your SDLC to quickly fix this. So penetration testing's found an issue, or an attack has found an issue. You need to race around your SDLC, producing updated code, deploy it as quickly as possible to fix the issue. And some companies, that takes a while. Like uh, places I've worked, there's been the, you know, I'm allowed to do the everyone stop everything. We need to fix this issue. It's so severe. But for kind of moderate issues, there's normally a discussion about, you know, uh, is this more important than the release on Tuesday? Um, we've got a shareholder announcement, blah, blah, blah. Um, we know we can't divert people from these projects. And you've got to do things like, you know, branch, build a, you know, find the branch that's in production, um, branch from that, merge the changes back in, build, go through some sort of testing. Um, if you're one of those companies, you'll have a change review board um, and then release. And this could be days. Or if it's a legacy application that you don't have the source code for, this could be years, right? might not even be possible to change your Oracle Forms app that was built in 2002 because all those people are now dead. Um, so wh what process are you shortcutting? You know, like, you've got your normal process that protects you and releases secure code, and then you shortcut it in emergencies. So why don't you just shortcut it all the time? Anyway, that's a different talk. Um, but can we patch security issues without even touching the underlying website? So this is security teams that want to do something while the dev team is going through that churn um, to stop the issues. So what we do is replace the WAF with a more capable layer. And um, I've called that, let me secure that for you, because you know, like we're the security team, we'll fix it for you. 
Um, and the virtual patching layer is, is kind of a WAF and more. Um, so the idea of virtual patching has been around for a while. Firewall vendors use the term. Um, basically, the idea is to prevent the exploitation of a vulnerability that you know about. Um, it's kind of agile in the nimble meaning of the word. Um, uh, as I said, security teams. Um, and you can react quickly. And that's basically the, the main thing. Um, there's some info on OWASP site. So our approach um, in this project is in order to patch an issue, you need to understand it. You need to be able to reproduce it. And once you understand it, you only patch exactly that issue. If you over patch, if you say, I've got an issue on this one page, I'm going to protect the whole site, you often end up with false positives. Um, and you, know, you go through this tuning process, and it's really slow. But you're in a hurry. This is urgent. So you just pat patch the issues you know about. Um, so how are we actually going to do this? And what kind of things do we need to do commonly? This slide really annoys me um, because the pixels don't line up, and I couldn't make it do it. Um, so, so some of the things you need to do. So you might want to block traffic from different countries, from different IP addresses. Maybe block certain pages on your site that are just so bad you just want to turn the page off temporarily. Um, you might want to add headers into the responses or make the cookies HTTP only or secure. Um, that kind of thing could be done by a simple reverse proxy. Um, you might need a WAF um, if you want to detect you know, signature-based attacks like SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Um, WAFs can sometimes replace HTML. Um, though normally they're pretty limited, um, add CSRF protection. Um, but there's other kinds of issues that a WAF can't fix. So they can't normally modify requests to neutralize attacks. They normally just block the requests. Um, they don't really understand users and roles and privileges or application state. Um, and so you really need to write your own code to do this. Um, when we react, there's the, the traditional like blocker user. Someone's from, what's a bad country? Someone's from somethingistan, um, and you're like, we're going to block everyone from that country. Um, you might send them to an error page. You might transform the response. So someone's trying to look at something they're not supposed to see, so you remove those bits from the response. Um, you might add additional validation, like, uh, the issue is that they can sign up with a really simple password. So you, in your code, uh, when you're fixing the issue, patching it, um, you add additional validation messages to say, you know, please choose a stronger password. Um, and of course, we need to alert so we know there's actually an attack. Uh, so this is the uh, architecture. Um, so just to be clear, I haven't built a software product. I've just cobbled together stuff to demonstrate the concepts. Um, so what we have is a kind of a reverse proxy on steroids. Um, we've got Apache with mod security and the core rule set, which I'll talk about. Um, Node.js, where we can write our own code. And it sits in front of a web server. So some of you just like shuddered and uh, went, oh my god, he said the word WAF. Um, WAFs are horrible. Our users hate them because they get blocked. Or our, our developers hate them. Our sysadmins hate them. Our security teams hate them. We try to WAF and we're never doing it again. We only have one because of PCI and we have it turned off, but it keeps the auditor happy. <laughs> um, and uh, those are all valid criticisms of WAFs. Um, they tend to have a bad reputation. Um, but remember how I said we're only patching known vulnerabilities or weaknesses? So we're only doing the bare minimum to fix the security issues. We're not turning on this WAF with all its crazy rules. OK, so, uh, so nothing is good without a demo. Um, so I used to be a developer, so I'm really good at writing vulnerable websites. Um, so this is my application. It's called Zero Days. Um, on this site, you can buy vulnerability, uh, what do you call them, exploits. Um, so I thought it was a cool, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it'll take off, but I'm accepting venture capital funding, so. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, blockchain and AI, then I'll be set. Um, so things you can do on this site is you can look at the details of a product, you can add it to a shopping cart, um, you can buy two of them if you want, 
uh, because two exploits are better than one. Um, you can register. Um, so, oh, here's a username. Okay, password test. Um, so register a user and now you're logged in. Um, what else? Oh, you can go through and buy stuff. So it's kind of a shopping cart where you enter your details. Autofill. State NZ in Australia. Oh, we talked about that. <laughs> Elizabeth is not going to be happy. Um, oh, you can uh, pay for stuff. Oh, automatic credit card filling is disabled. Um, here's a credit card number I've learnt. Cool. Hopefully, no one captures that. Um, and then you get to look at your order and, you know, see the payment details, see how you're paying for it, and then place the order, and then you go to the screen of all your current orders and you can look at them and see their status. Cool. So um, other things you can do is uh, you can, like, social media the crap out of this and have comments, like, this is the best ghost script ever. Um, and, you know, like, I don't know how social media works, something like that. It's, it's people writing stuff, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's our application. Uh, we've released this, it's in production. Um, and then we get this, a pen test report from Acme Security Limited, uh, which has tested the security of our application. And so we go, oh yeah, this is interesting. It's a mighty long table of contents, someone's been busy. And, wow, red's a really pretty color to put on a table. There seems to be a lot of it. And uh, you find out you've got all these security issues. Uh, so as you saw when I signed up, uh, you could sign up with simple passwords like test. Um, as you saw when I viewed the product, uh, so I reviewed the order, um, for some reason we're storing and displaying credit card numbers. Some people recommend against that. Um, <laughs> What else? Oh, it turns out there's actually an admin section of the site um, where you can look at um, everybody's orders um, and all the products and change their prices and stuff. And <laughs> it's not in the URL, so no one's ever going to find that, uh, except for the pen testers, of course. Um, oh, the, this one's a good one. Um, and this actually worked for a friend of mine for a laptop. Is, um, you can put like negative numbers and quantities on the shopping cart and they'll actually pay you money when they ship it to you. <laughs> um, uh, so he didn't actually, just to be clear, he didn't actually get paid by IBM, but he did get a laptop for one dollar um, <laughs> and they honored it. Um, oh, other issues, so, um, you know, like when you're entering a comment, you can do the very security suspicious script alert one um, and, you know, totally hack a website using cross-site scripting. Um, there's a search field where you can search for everything to do with GhostScript. Um, oh, you probably saw it in the pop-up. Um, but you can also stick other random SQL into the search statement and get back other stuff. Um, and it turns out, um, if you run a tool against, called SQL Map against this, in less than 60 seconds, oh, no, sorry, in 61 seconds, um, from that one text box entry of the site, it will figure out that there's SQL injection, the database is SQLite, um, found the names of all the tables in my database, and then dump the data from the tables, um, otherwise known as the Sony Uber uh, LinkedIn hack. Um, so that's SQL injection, um, and then there's some other kind of, I guess, uh, application logic issues. So when I look at my orders, um, they're ID 7 and 8, and you can see there's an ID in the URL. If I change it to 6, I can see Joe Bloggs' order, which is really cool because I've always wanted to know where he lives. Um, everyone says it's not a real person. Um, and when you're buying stuff, um, you know, as well as being able to enter negative quantities, um, you can also just skip screens and go straight to step four of the shopping cart process and place an order, and then you don't need to enter your credit card details. And luckily, the fulfillment process doesn't check that it has actually been paid, and so stuff gets shipped. 
Cool, so uh, we've done a really good job building this. Um, and management's received this report, they've freaked out a little bit, and um, we gotta fix stuff as quickly as possible. Uh, so here's just a summary of the issues. I think I covered all of them, I didn't cover CSRF. Um, but basically this is as bad as it could be. So how would we secure that for the dev team while they're building? Um, this is my way of doing it. So mod security is an open source web application firewall. Uh, many people thought it was dead. Um, it, it did kind of get a little bit slow there for a while. But it's back with a vengeance now. They've just released version three um, and there's an active development team working on it. Um, the OWASP core rule set is a bunch of signatures for common attacks. Um, and Node.js is this thing where you write JavaScript and like magic happens. Um, and you can store state anywhere you want, but I'm using Redis because you know it's cheap memory-based cache. Um, hey Docker, um, I just love that my simple application uses three different versions of Linux. I don't know. Um, so, so how does this look? Um, so this project's online, it's not, I don't know, it's not revolutionary, but some ideas you might like. Um, so what I do when I'm looking at vulnerabilities is I stick them in a spreadsheet and give them all numbers, or stick them in a bug tracker and use the bug tracker numbers. Um, and when I'm actually patching the issues, I refer to them by number so that you know, everything links together. Um, so this Apache configuration, I've got mod security and the core rule set which has um, a bunch of built-in rules. I've only actually pulled in some of the rules because like I was saying, I only want to patch known vulnerabilities. Um, and then for each of the issues, um, I've got a file for each issue, like a config file in Apache, which is fixing each individual issue. Uh, so yeah, there's that. Um, in terms of the Node application, I'm not a JavaScript developer, this is probably not idiomatic, um, but I did the same thing. So each vulnerability that gets fixed has its own module, um, which I require, and then I hook them up to the proxy so that it, they look at the traffic on the way through. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. So as I was saying, mod security, um, really good mod security book just released last year. I was gonna bring it, but um, I was trying to travel light um, but you can look at some sample chapters online. Um, Mod security version three has been rewritten so it's less Apache specific. Um, and so the idea is that Nginx and IIS and any other web server can use it um, with less instability. The old version had kind of a bit weird stuff. Um, it doesn't do much out of the box, so mod security default installation pretty much does nothing and then you turn on what you need it to do. So it's very safe to have just sitting there waiting for vulnerabilities. Um, and yeah, um, oh the other thing that's weird is um, it uses Apache configuration syntax um, because that's its uh, history, um, which means that you basically get three fields on a line where you configure everything to do mod security. Um, so it's pretty nasty. Uh, the mod security core rule set um, covers a bunch of common attacks and the team has tuned it to avoid false positives. So, you know, they've got SQL injection and cross-site scripting, but in the default mode, it will only capture real SQL injection. And if you find a false positive, they actually adjust the rule set. Um, the way it's split up is they have a bunch of rules for looking at requests, so stuff going into your web server, so they'll look for different types of attacks. They have more rules that look at responses, so leakages as data leaves your web server, like maybe credit card numbers. Um, and then they have a scoring system, and at the end, the request and the response get evaluated and maybe blocked. So, um, yeah, so there might be a few things that look a little bit suspicious, but when you add them together, it's definitely an attack. Um, this is the syntax, so sec rule and then three parameters um, in your Apache config or mod security config. Um, 
you apply something to some variables, so maybe the request file name or other examples below, like the address of the person coming in or some cookie values. Um, you have an operator that you run over it. Uh, so this is a syntax for running a regular expression. Um, that's not a very good regular expression, but um, you know, uh, checking if the URL is order slash details, um, and you can do comparisons and regexes. Um, and then there's some actions, and actions are where it gets crazy in mod security. Uh, so this is how I laid mine out. I think it's based on Christian's recommendation in his book. So you have, you have to have a unique ID for every rule, which you manually manage. Um, there's a phase where it um, looks at different, uh, I'm trying to use a different word than phase, different steps of the request processing. So processing the request header, the request body, the response header, the response body, and logging. So when do you want this rule to run? Um, what action do you want to take if this rule matches? Do you want to deny the user? Do you want to allow the user? Do you want to alert? Um, do you want to log it? Uh, transformations you want to do on the incoming data. So if you've got a case insensitive operating system, I don't know, I can only think of one. Um, maybe you want to no lowercase everything before you run the regex over it. Uh, normalize it to remove escaping. Um, and then a message that you actually want to log. So yeah, it's pretty simple, uh, but extremely ugly. Um, if you want to do like Boolean logic, here's how you and two rules together. You write one rule, you chuck the word chain in the middle of it, and then the next rule only runs if the first one ran. Um, and if you want to do ors, you kind of do this really weird skip after thing where um, the first rule runs, and then if that matched, it'll skip the then bit and go to the else marker and run that. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure you're all like shuddering inside. What it really needs is like a DSL on top of it that generates this stuff. Um, and there was a project for that a few years ago, but um, I haven't seen much out of it. Uh, so, demo. So, uh, looking at our vulnerabilities, um, the one that people like the most seemed to be the admin one. Um, so, what I've got is the same website, but with mod security and Node.js in front, and you can tell it's fixed because I changed the image. Um, so, this is the exact same web server. Um, it's running in the same uh, Docker um, doodaki. I think that's a technical term. Um, but my proxy has replaced the image request and fixing some security issues. Um, and uh, doesn't have a valid uh, SSL cert, so sorry about that. Um, so the first issue we had was that anyone could go to the admin URLs, admin orders, and see the orders. Um, and it turns out that uh, we can block that using uh, mod security. So how do we do that? Um, well, it's kind of a little bit weird, but in mod security, um, and you can use this as an example if you're interested in doing this, um, you can track requests to the login page, uh, see if they were successful, um, so a redirect happened instead of the page returning with an error message, and if it was successful, um, set like this uh, environment variable of who the user is. Um, and then in your rule in mod security, you can say, if someone's going to slash admin, um, check that there is a user set and that the user is the admin user. Uh, so uh, on the site now, if I log in as the admin user, and sorry, it does have my work email address. Forgot to change that. Um, now the admin user can go to admin orders, but no one else can um, because mod security is keeping track of who the current user is. Cool. Um, so the negative one quantities in the shopping cart, um, that's pretty simple. Um, so like I said, how you could do regular expressions. So I'm just doing a simple regex that um, says if it's not a digit, um, so if there's a minus sign in there, then block the request. Um, it's not a great UI um, blocking the user. Um, you might want to do more, like redirect them to an error page or something like that. Um, and on the server side, um, when the user's blocked, hey, what's that doing? 
Uh, somewhere in here, mod security logs the details, and it's a little bit hard to understand, so you might want to parse the logs. Um, but in here it's saying, you know, my regex um, matching against this argument on this URL um, failed, and here's the error message, invalid quantity. So you can detect that kind of thing. Um, Cross-site scripting, uh, this is kind of where mod security is good um, uh, because it understands cross-site scripting. Okay, so that's already got cross-site scripting, so we might go to a different product. Uh, so I need to log in. Test. Um, so now if I try to enter a script tag with a very uh, dangerous alert one, um, mod security blocks that. Um, and actually how it does it is kind of interesting. Um, so, oh, sorry, I've got slides with, you know, like human readable versions of how those ones I showed worked. Um, so, the mod security core rule sets has this regular expression. Um, oh, sorry, 26 regular expressions. Um, and this is actually mach machine generated with one of those things that, like, simplifies a regular expression. Um, and uh, so the project has actually been working on like decompiling these regexes and figuring out what they actually do because they've been lost in the sands of time. But pretty much what it's looking for is, you know, script tags, on click equals, on alert equals, um, and a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, Mod security also uses a library called libinjection, which I think is actually the proper way to detect cross-site scripting, where it actually parses the input and looks for JavaScript fragments that are valid JavaScript and blocks those instead. And this is because pretty much it's always possible to avoid a regex filter. Um, oh, we did see viewing other people's orders. Uh, where's my browser? Um, so I'm logged in as the test user. Um, how are we going to fix this? So when they go to the, the screen here, I can only see order six, seven, and eight. How are we going to block order, sorry, I can only see order seven, eight, and nine. How are we gonna block order six from the test user? Like, we don't have access to the database in our node code. Um, we only can see the requests and responses. Uh, so we do a trick. Um, what we do is we say, when the user goes to the orders page, we parse the HTML and keep track of the numbers they're allowed to see, seven, eight, and nine. And if they ever try and view any orders, we make sure that they can only see that number. Uh, so order seven, if I change it to six, okay, I didn't write very, very user-friendly response. Uh, I just dropped the connection. Um, and so how does that look in Node? Um, so uh, this is, oh, I haven't shown the slides of how the Node proxy works yet. Bugger. Um, doing this out of order. Um, basically, uh, when I request uh, the order details page, I stash all the order details into Redis and then um, make sure that the user is only allowed to see those order details. You can look at that code online. Um, so SQL injection is the same as cross-site scripting. Um, it has a similarly hideous regex. Um, cross-site request forgery is possible to do in mod security, um, but kind of nasty. Uh, which one was that? Um, because what you need to do is some crypto, you need to generate a token and, uh, man, that's not going to be good for your tablet. Um, generate a token, make sure that requests have that token to block cross-site request forgery. And uh, mod security is not great at doing that, um, but it is possible. Um, uh, normal proxy things to add response headers and um, edit cookies to add flags. So, so why do I think mod security is a good solution here? Um, the core rule set has that low false positive set of rules that's pretty comprehensive even though we don't totally understand how they work. Mod security is pretty efficient, like it runs inside Apache but doesn't add much overhead. Um, and in the future I think faster web servers are going to have modules that hopefully will be fast as well. Um, it allows simple things to be done relatively easily, like so blocking a URL is relatively easy, um, but some things are hard, and the things that are hard are really hard. Um, and also, mod security 
I mean, it's not great. It doesn't understand state. It doesn't really have a data store that's got kind of a data store. You can't manipulate requests and responses like you could with real code, um, just string replaces. Um, the syntax is crazy, um, and it's extensible via Lua, but as far as I can tell, no one does that, and there's very few examples. The main example seems to be someone who's really upset with Lua and its handling of numbers. Um, so business logic vulnerabilities. So first we need to think about how do applications keep state. So normally most applications will have a data store like a database at the back end. Um, it might have an in-memory cache, might have a disk uh, where it stores stuff. You know, there might be a farm of Redis servers or something like that. Um, or it might store state on the client side, you know, encrypted cookies or you know, URL parameters or hidden fields. Um, and basically, the main property of state storage in a web app is you want it to survive. You don't want your web server to reboot and all your users have lost their shopping carts or um, you know, like a network interruption happens or a failover happens um, and everyone's videos start from the beginning. So we need to store state in our proxy layer, in our reverse proxy, so that we can uh, replicate business logic. Um, and so that's where we're using Redis. Um, and we also uh, can write code in Node to transform. So how I'm doing that is I'm using the, the Node.js HTTP proxy, wrapping it with Redbird, um, which is another library which has some extra features that make it nice, um, and then using this library called Harmon, which can stream HTML and modify it on the fly with CSS selectors, so it's quite performant. Um, I haven't tested the performance of that, but there, yeah, those two libraries added 160 Node modules to my directory, which I thought was a little excessive, but um, that's kind of how Node works. Um, here's how a proxy works. I think this is a very valuable 30 seconds of the talk. Um, so the browser sends a request to the proxy. The proxy copies it to an internal representation and then forwards it on to the web server. The web server replies after some time. The proxy copies it back and sends the response back to the browser. Uh, so voila, that's how a proxy works. Um, with the node layer that we're sticking in there, um, we stick a request handler and a response handler. So after copying the request, um, node sends it to each request handler one after the other. They can do some modification of the request or even send a response. Um, then the proxy sends the altered request onto the server. The server replies. Um, the proxy sends the response from the server through another transformation process in the response handler, which gets copied back uh, into the response that the user gets. Uh, so basically, um, my node setup just has a bunch of request response handlers, one per vulnerability that are chained together. Uh, so I jumped into this by mistake earlier. Um, so as I was saying, uh, just a bunch of node modules. Um, each one you hook up to the proxy. Sorry, this is ugly syntax, but you know, so when I change the image, I'm only doing that on requests. Um, when I'm fixing the order numbers, which order numbers you're allowed to see, um, on the response, I need to gather up all the order numbers that the user's allowed to see, and then on subsequent requests, block them if that's not in the list. Um, so other things that you can do is, um, Uh, when you're looking at orders, uh, I need to log in. <laughs> Service unavailable. Hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, downtime. Awkward. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so when you look at your orders um, in the vulnerable web application, um, you could see the credit card number and expiry. And we're not changing the application, so it still stores credit card numbers and sends it to the proxy, but the proxy just trims them out. Um, so here there's some CSS collect selectors, so you know it's in a div with that name. I get the value out of that div and I replace it with asterisks. Um, and in another one, I just replace it by a payment received by a credit card, which is the one you saw on the screen. And so that's kind of nice. Um, to be able to modify content programmatically. Uh, 
So we talked about that one. Uh, skipping the payment step. So um, I want to keep track of, for the current user, which steps of the payment they've been through, uh, of the shopping cart they've been through, so they can't skip step three. Um, and then check that no step is missed. And similarly, I stick that into Redis to keep track of. Um, HTML manipulation, like I said, it's pretty simple with, with that library um, and reasonably performant, though I haven't tested the performance, so you'll need to do that. Uh, PCI compliance, ha, ha, ha. Um, so other examples of things you can do when you can write code in your proxy is you can you know, check for strong passwords and give validation errors. Uh, when someone logs in with a weak password, you could send them to the change password page and say you really need to change your password. Um, tamper protection on hidden fields, so sometimes there's security sensitive stuff. You could add a checksum with a cryptographic um, uh, hash in it. Um, you can change validation rules, um, you can inspect stuff, you can protect stuff. Um, so, ha, this is my funny slide, why use Node.js for the proxy? JavaScript is the language of the internet. No, I'm not really here to tell you that Node.js is the best way to do it, just to show you the concept of you could have this thing sitting in front of your web server. When vulnerabilities come, you can fix them quickly. Um, oh, asynchronous programming is hard. Yeah. I remember the days when if statements were simple. Um, cool, and the, the thing is trying to figure out where you fix stuff is sometimes an issue. So, so that's this talk. Uh, what I really wanted you to get out of this talk was that virtual patching is a thing. Like, it is a thing that security teams can do. It's a thing that you can put in front of old applications that you can't fix quickly, um, or third-party applications. Um, it's another tool that you can add to your tool belt. Um, so, you know, if you're a security team or an AppSec team or a dev team, um, this is another thing that you can use to solve problems apart from releasing a new version of your software. Um, it works best if you prefer the infrastructure in advance. So if you have this sitting there with no rules enabled and you, it's going to uh, hardly reduce performance at all, you might want to test that. Um, and you know, you can just jump in there and do something quickly and make a really targeted change. Um, and really, it, it took this diagram and fixed the missing bit, which was uh, we can build our software securely, host it securely, and verify it's secure, but we can't react to vulnerabilities in our software uh, as fast as we can to vulnerabilities in our hardware or our OS. Um, so it really lets us react quickly. Uh, remember, my, th my, my, my most important advice to you is to only patch exactly the issue that is vulnerable. Uh, don't go and turn all the things on. Um, you will have a bad day. Um, and to finish up, if any of you happen to be in Auckland, I'm helping organize an OWAS conference uh, next week, <laughs> week after. I don't know, we should really get onto the organization. Um, so OWASP is a web application security project. It's a really great resource, but a really bad website um, of information about common web vulnerabilities. Um, and so you could go to the OWASP site, you could go to meetups. We run one in Wellington, Auckland, there's probably some around here. There was an OWASP conference in Melbourne last year. Um, and if you want to find out more about web security, go there. Um, rather than looking at the actual OWASP website, it's probably better to look at other people's write-ups of OWASP stuff. So YouTube videos or blog posts, just because, I don't know, OWASP site's kind of dense. Cool, so that's me. Um, let me secure your website for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Oh, I just wanted to say uh, there's that lmstfu.com has got the GitHub repo with that code. I don't think you'll want to use that code, but you might want to look at the structure or examples in there. Cool. Please thank Kirk again. Mm. Uh, we